Okay, so some logistic items. So if you have questions, um, the best way to get those answered is the Q&A feature because we do have a really big group with us today. The Q&A feature makes, helps us keep track of what is answered and what's not answered. And the TAs are gonna be helping out. We have a big group and they have TA or at the beginning of their name on the Zoom. So that's how you can find them. They're gonna make sure we collect all the questions and get those answered. And we'll try to answer questions live. But since, yeah, we do have a big group, I'm not sure we'll get to everything, but we'll try to collect all the questions and at least answer them tomorrow or get you an answer in the future. So we'll be doing hands-on exercises, like I said, in that featured workspace where we will demonstrate what we're all gonna be doing together. And then we'll give you time to complete those exercises in breakout rooms. And in order to access that featured workspace and attend today, you need to be registered and you need to have controlled tier access. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's the agenda. For our first day here, we're starting with an All of Us project overview and a platform tour to get to know the researcher workbench. Next, we're gonna start getting hands-on with duplicating the featured workspace and looking at the All of Us genomic data in the notebooks. And then our third step is that we are going to start running a GWAS. Okay, next. Okay, and then tomorrow we will be wrapping up our GWAS topic. We are going to look at the other genomic data that are available, and then we're going to take it up a next level and do an advanced GWAS and, and try to answer all the questions we have so that everyone can apply this information for their own research. Okay, next slide. Yes, so like I said earlier, the, you need controlled tier access to attend today. You need controlled tier access to access the featured workspace. So if anyone is unsure, you can log into your profile on the researcher workbench at researchallofus.org, and you could go into your profile and you want to make sure that you have data access registered tier and controlled tier. And so we will be posting this recording within a week, making sure that we don't, um, and it will be posted publicly. So if you don't have access now, you can look at this recording in the future. But right now, if you do not have control to your access, please go ahead and log off. All right, okay. thank you Libby, for the overview. Um, I'm gonna be jumping in now and, and taking over for a little bit. Uh, my name is Michael. I am a scientific project manager uh, with the DRC or Data Research Center, a uh, part of all of us. Um, and we are really interested in kind of knowing kind of who we're speaking with and who's coming here and interested in joining this workshop. We really want this to be an introductory workshop. Um, so if you're really, really talented with working with genomic data, this might not be for you. But if you have no idea what's going on, that's kind of what we're aiming at. So we want to kind of know who we're working with. So if you could just answer and fill out uh, our little survey, we would love to kind of see what we're looking at. And then in a little bit, I think we can pull the polls up and see kind of where everybody's at and kind of gauge where everybody's in. So we have the very comfortable, the somewhat comfortable, and then the not comfortable. Um, and even if you're not comfortable, hopefully we'll be able to walk you all through that. Um, so I think that's probably, hopefully enough time for someone to choose one of the three options. Can we post that poll at all? Is that possible? We view that. Um, let's see, it looks like most people have um, responded. Um, I can just, you know what, if we can't can't show it, um, I'm happy just to give the results. It looks like 38% are not comfortable. They've only used it a little. About 50% have used it a moderate amount, and then 12% are comfortable and use it frequently. So um, excellent. That and sounds that's good. about with 130 people that are responding. Great, excellent. That's great to know. Um, so hopefully we'll really be helping everybody, um, but especially geared toward that one and two area. Um, three, awesome to have you. Uh, one more question for everybody, and we want to know kind of a little bit about yourself and your background and who's really engaging with this resource. Um, so we have one more quick question for you, and hopefully if we could fill that out, then we could kind of understand 
uh, who, who we're all talking to in this very big group. So are, we're interested to know, like, are you someone that's familiar with genomic analysis? Are you kind of new to it and you're looking to explore into that? And we have all these different data types in all of us. And it's like, oh, it'd be great to be able to connect what I'm interested in, which is not genomics. And that's not my specialty with genomic data. That would be a really powerful tool set to use. Um, or do you already have background in both, or are you just coming in blind? You don't really have a lot of experience with either any of our data types that you want to know more. Um, let us know. And then Chris, let me know when we're looking like we're hitting that quota and feel free to let us know who we're talking with. Yeah, and you know what? I'll end it in like 15 seconds after it's been a minute. I think I can click a button to share it. So I'll try it that this time uh, once Perfect. we end the poll. But um, and let me know if you know people can view it. If not, I'm happy to uh, just announce the answers. Perfect. So Chris, end it right now. That sounds good. I think that should be good. Oh, and I think we can all see it. At least I can see it. Uh, so we have 38% uh, with a primary genomic background, 46% with a new to genomics, 11% uh, with both, and 5% neither. So that's great. Um, it's great seeing that there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of genomic background that are trying to engage with this new to data set. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of give you the tools and understanding and knowledge to really start using that and going forward. So that's great. Um, thank you all so much for, for attending and for filling that out. Um, and now I want to kind of give a baseline overview. Um, if you've seen this before, I apologize, but for those who haven't, hopefully it'll give a background of what the All of Us program is um, and kind of what our goals and what we want to do as a program and how we want to engage with researchers. So the overall mission of the All of Us research program is to <laughs> really accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs and really have an impact on treatment and personalized medicine down the line. So we have this by nurturing different partnerships uh, with up to and beyond a million participants that has an emphasis on diversity. So we want to have a very diverse uh, population of participants within our data set. And then this will help us deliver one of the largest, richest biomedical data sets that researchers can engage with. Um, that hopefully is going to be very different than a lot of our, the other big data sets out there. And then hopefully along that way, catalyze an ecosystem of communities, of researchers and funders, kind of similar how we're doing right now and kind of developing that ecosystem, having researchers engage with the data and understand what they're doing and helping you to work with our, the data and make these breakthroughs along the way. So where we're at currently um, is we have our lofty goal of having a database of at least 1 million participants from across the United States. We currently have data available for researchers. This is our row-level data um, from over 400,000 participants. And what's really, really makes this unique um, is that 75% of those participants come from an underrepresented in biomedical research background, and specifically 45% from a racial or ethnic background. So we really are kind of taking this data set that's normally on these big data sets that are, have a very European-centric ancestry and having a very, very different um, population than, than those that are normally presented. <clears throat> Speaking of our data, we have a lot of different data types. So we have over 400,000 uh, participants that have filled out survey responses. So these are self-reported um, surveys that you can go online to our research hub that was brought up earlier. Um, and see what those questions are, what the surveys are, and participants will fill these out, and these normally uh, kind of give backgrounds on their health, their social economic status, and then you compare this survey data with a bunch of different data types, such as physical measurements with height and, height and weight, electronic health records, and then <clears throat> and Fitbit as well. You can see that we have about over 15,000 participants that have Fitbit data links as well. What we're really going to be focusing on is how that relates to our genomic data. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. In this workshop and how to engage with our genomic data. So we currently have the biggest genomic data set in the world with over 245,000 short read whole genome sequences and over 300,000 genotyping arrays. Um, and then also recently, back in April, we added structural variant data. So we have over 11,000 participants that have structural variant data, as well as 11, uh, sorry, 1,000 participants that have long read whole genome sequences. So all this data is available for registered um, <coughs> control tier users. 
And we'll be going into how to work with this list, list workshop. What really power comes in is being able to link this genomic data with our other data types, so electronic health records, physical measurements, and surveys. And you can do this with over 200,000 of our participants. I'm so sorry. I have something stuck in my throat. <clears throat> and that's what really, really makes this exciting. <clears throat> the way that we actually get this data to our participants is through our data curation process. So we have all of our, these different data sources, so electronic health records, <clears throat> genomic data. We harmonize all of that data, and then we refine it and curate it, and then release that data for our researchers to use. So we have data releases about once a year. <clears throat> our most recent data release was this past April, um, and that is the version 7 of our data set. So expect this data set to not be static. It is going to continue to evolve and expand. We're always looking to figure out, okay, what new data types do we want to add? And we get responses and we're very eager to find out from researchers what data would be interesting to you. So if you have questions about what the data we have is, or if you have data type that you would like us to expand to, let us know. We'd really like to know and we'll work on getting that data, curating it, and have that available to you. We really want to make this data available for researchers as much as possible, since we do have that commitment to advancing personalized medicine. But this is also very important to have this secure data. So we really want to have that balance of sharing widely and wisely. So in order to do this, we have a couple different at, uh, data access tiers. So there is our public tier. <laughs> which has aggregate counts of rounded to the nearest 20 and data snapshots. So that kind of shows how many participants uh, from our specific different data types, such as conditions with the EHR, um, how many participants have genomic data. All of that is available for anybody to see on our, uh, our research hub. And there's the link there. If you want to go and check that out, you can see and explore if there's a specific data that you're interested in, participant group that you're interested in, do we have their data in our data set? It's a huge data set, but it's not all encompassing. So it's a great place to go and kind of generate hypotheses. Once you become a registered user, there's both the registered tier and control tier, and that's where you will actually access the row level data. We're going to be focusing on the control tier, which has the genomic data. The control tier has a few more, uh, a little bit more training, as you guys know. Uh, to kind of make sure that it's handled securely and safely. So that's where our genomic data is kept. <clears throat> and the way that you will be interacting with this data is through the cloud uh, compute platform, the researcher workbench. We have a slightly different approach for, to, for cloud computing um, for, uh, versus kind of traditional approaches. So rather than bringing this data to researchers and having them work on their own computers or their own kind of tools and, and, and resources, we are bringing researchers to the data and having this on a specific <coughs> secure location. So that is our research workbench. This allows it to be a much more secure for the data set. So we're not downloading the data. It hopefully also makes it a lower cost for the researchers. This is kind of the next step is we're going to be going on to the researcher workbench. <clears throat> and Chris is going to be handling it off from here. So this is where we'll actually get a hands-on demonstration of how to go through the researcher workbench. But before that, I do want to see if there's any questions about the general program. Um, I think we have a couple minutes to just go through and see if there are. If you do have a question, please raise your hand and then we will unmute you and allow you to kind of do that. Thank you. And if we don't have any questions in the next minute or so, then I'm going to hand it off to Chris. Thanks, Michael. We do have a question oh. from Nathan. Yeah, I just had one question. Um, sorry, there's background noise. My AC went out, so I'm having to use the attic fan. It's like when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> so uh, sometimes when I'm using Chrome on a Mac and I have, I'm have i logging into the workbench, you know, I have my thing set up. Sometimes I just randomly get a 403 forbidden, but then when I reload and log in, then it usually gets me there. I, I just want to make sure I'm not 
have anything set incorrectly. Or I'm just providing feedback. <laughs> Sometimes it just gives me a, when I just log in, using Chrome okay. to the workbench, I get this 403, you don't have access forbidden error. But then I close it and reopen it and then I'm logged in. So I don't know why it's doing that. That's good feedback to hear. Uh, Chris, have you ever heard of that happening or do you have a kind of any insight on that? Yeah. I think uh, Gage uh, sent an article in the chat to talk about this. You know, that may have been um, about a different question. Jennifer, maybe I missed it. Um, yeah, I mean, other than resetting, um, resetting cookies, and I think there's maybe another, some other thing you might be able to do. Um, I, you know, I don't, I haven't personally encountered that one now, that one specifically, so I haven't, you know, worked through it, but I think that's probably the best suggestion I would give is to try resetting cookies and, um, there might be some other settings you, you have to reset. Um, emptying the cache, okay. Uh, One thing yeah, too that there. you could also think about is uh, if your Chrome profiles are changing unintentionally, um, so keeping separate browsers open just for your Chrome profile for prod and pre-prod and not mixing that with maybe your personal Gmail account if you, uh, unintentionally switch over to your Gmail account. Yeah, that that's a good idea. I guess restrict the permission, um, and you may not know until you re-log back in. Um, not just the main profile, but the other profiles. Or I, I get confused on that because I have tons of other profiles. But anyway, I, I got you. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, you for asking. Though, um, are there any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to. Hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Michael. Um, let me share my screen. Um, hopefully everyone can see this. It's uh, an image of the researcher workbench, the main landing page that Michael just showed. Um, so I'm going to give a quick tour um, and then lead you through the first exercise, which is duplicating the featured workspace that we'll be using today. Um, so probably many of you are aware, but in case you're not, um, Generally, analyses of projects are um, grouped into workspaces where one project corresponds to one workspace. Um, because of that, I'm gonna just sort of give you an overview of how to use the workspaces and some of the things inside of them that allow you to analyze the data. So I'm gonna use this one that I've created before called CT version seven test. Um, you'll notice on the uh, upper right-hand portion that I'm highlighting, it this the data set that the workspace is linked to. It says controlled tier data set version seven, which is the most recent one. Um, one thing that I want to note is that once you create a workspace and you link it to a CDR, that can't actually change. You have to duplicate the workspace to change it. Um, you'll also see at the top three different tabs, including data analysis and about. I'm going to start with the about tab really quick. Uh, basically, this is information that you'll input during the workspace creation process that we'll go through and duplicate the workspace. Um, where you write an educational purpose, uh, the summary of the research purpose, uh, how you'll disseminate those findings, and anticipated outcomes. Um, now for this one, you can see I don't have any anticipated outcomes because this is sort of a demo that I use for operational work. Uh, but we just keep in mind that we ask you to be somewhat thoughtful about how you answer these and how they how it will pertain to your research because these will be publicly posted on our main research hub page in a uh, project directory. So make sure you um, we sort of put information there that would be good for other researchers to know about what you're working on. Um, some other things I want to alert your attention to. Um, if you're the workspace owner and the original creator, you can view a detailed spend report by clicking this link here in GCP. And you can also browse some files in GCP that might be associated with your workspace. If you're using a credits for your workspace, it'll give you the total that have been used thus far. Um, and the last thing I want to point out on this page is that um, it's very easy to collaborate within the workbench um, through these workspaces, and you can do so by clicking the share button here. There's other ways to, to share your workspace, but this is probably the easiest. Um, and so, for example, if I want to share it with Michael, I'll just put his last name in and add him. Um, I can add him as a reader, which would give him access to view everything in the workspace, but not actually generate any environments or notebooks himself. Um, I can give him writer access, which would give him the ability to create notebooks and edit them, uh, but not actually share the workspace with other people. Or I could give him full owner access, which would give him the same permissions I do, except being able to update the billing information. So yeah, that's just some basic information about how to um, about the tab in the workspace. Um, 
what do you do when you're actually trying to analyze your work? Um, probably the best place to start is in the data tab. Um, you don't need to start here, but um, we have two really incredibly user-friendly tools that are good for both new users and advanced users. Um, one of which is the cohort builder, which you can use here, as well as the data set builder. I'm not going to get into the details about how to use them because Jennifer will be going over that in more depth, but um, just an overview of what they do. The cohort builder will allow you to select specific participants based on criteria that you're looking for from the larger, you know, 400,000 uh, plus participant pool that's available in the most current CDR. Um, it will not actually pull any data that you want associated with those uh, with that cohort. In order to do that, you need to utilize the data set builder where you can combine your cohort as well as different variables that are associated with your cohort to create a data set. Um, and just so you know, we call these uh, variables concepts. And as I said, Jennifer will go into this in a little more detail. Um, you can also pull genomic data for cohorts of less than 5,000 people if you're interested. Um, and one thing I want to mention is even though you can use these tools, um, you don't have to use these tools um, if you want to pull data into a notebook and analyze it. Um, you can just do so using your own SQL queries yourself. Um, how do you actually analyze the data? That's done in the analysis tab through Jupyter Notebooks, um, which you can create. Um, your workspace can have, I think, an indefinite number of notebooks, so feel free to make as many as you want, depending on what you're doing. Um, you can utilize R and Python. And, um, Genevieve will get into this in more detail, but they're powered by cloud analysis environments that you can customize. Um, and how to customize them will be covered by Genevieve. Um, so this is sort of a quick tour. I want to also mention how to you know, get help if you need it, because we realize this is a complicated tool, um, even though it's really powerful. Um, the best thing to do is just to go to the main menu and click Contact Us, and it'll, fill up, it'll pull up this widget, which you can use to ask a question or, or offer some other type of form for our help desk team um, will respond within one business day. Um, also, if you want to sort of try to figure out the answer yourself before contacting us, we encourage you to do that. You can go to the user support hub, which again is in this main menu, um, and you know either search for something you're looking for or go to one of our you know topics that we have listed down here. So for example, if you want to learn how to analyze genomic data, I'd start in this genomics tab. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this will this recording will be posted in our video section probably within a week or two. Uh, so go there if you want to do this later. Um, with that, I think I'm done with the tour. So I will pull up a slide really quickly. Um, and stop sharing really quick. Okay, let me share again. Um, so this will be covering the first exercise, which is duplicating the featured workspace. Um, I'll talk about what the featured workspaces are in a second, but basically we'll go to researchallofus.org, we'll sign in, um, we'll click featured workspace we're interested in, uh, duplicate it, and then set up a cloud analysis environment. Um, if you want to, you know, go along with us now, you can, but it'd probably just be better if you waited um, until you're in your breakout session and the TA can help you with questions. So um, let me go back to here. So if we go to researchallofus.org. Um, this is one way you can sign in by going to the researcher login button. You can also just go directly to workbench.researchallofus.org and sign in. Um, since I'm already signed in, I don't actually have to put in my password, which is nice. Um, it'll take me to the main landing page. It'll let us put the CT version 7 test workspace that I just was using as shown there because it's the most recent one I accessed. Um, now I'm going to go to featured workspaces. Um, I also wanted to point out that in addition to the support hub and contacting us, these are you know, great materials that I encourage everyone to look at, especially when they're getting started, but even if they've been using it for a while and they want information about a specific data type. So, for example, for new users, um, I'd strongly encourage you to look at this beginner introductory featured workspace, which explains how the data is organized and how to utilize the workbench effectively. Um, today, we'll be looking at this genomics workshop uh, featured workspace, but there's other featured workspaces for basically any main topic or data type that you might be interested in that's on the workbench. So, for example, you want to learn how to analyze survey data, we have a featured workspace just about that, right? Or physical measurement data. Um, these are great tools. You can utilize the code and run them yourselves. Um, I encourage everyone to look at these, no matter, you know, like I said, if they're a beginning user or an advanced user, because a lot of times you can find integration you need just in these. Um, but today we'll be focusing on the genomics workshop. So I'm going to open this and I want to point something out. So I'm like in that last featured work or that last workspace I showed you, which is not a featured workspace, it's a one line. I could click these buttons here, you'll notice that I can't actually do that, right? I can't use the cohort data set builder, nor can I 
um, edit notebooks. And the reason why is because unlike in that last workspace, this, I only have read-only access here. So we provide read-only access to these for all users because we basically don't want the notebooks to change, right? So we want everyone to access the same type of data. So you know you can copy and paste the code into your own workspace or duplicate the notebooks into your own workspace, but generally the best SOP for using these featured workspaces is simply just to duplicate them. So that's what we'll do. Um, and to do this, you can do it in one of two ways. You can either go to the menu button here and click duplicate, or you can go from the main menu and click duplicate there. They take you to the same page. Um, it will default to duplicate of X workspace, in this case, Genomics Workshop. I'd suggest probably leaving that name for those of you who are there, um, just for ease, but you feel free to change the name if you wish to. Um, you'll notice that the data access tier is controlled here. Whenever you're duplicating a workspace, the data access tier doesn't change from the original one, so just keep that in mind. And it defaults to the most recent data set version, which is V7, um, unless you're replicating a, a previously published result in an older one, you have to use this per our uh, data user code of conduct. So just keep it as that version seven. One thing I want to point out to not do, and I have done this before, is do not do not click this button. Um, we, we don't want to share this workspace with the original set of collaborators because it's a featured workspace. And basically, it would share it with, um, I think, maybe the five to 10 people who are listed as authors. So leave that blank. Don't click that. Um, if you do, that's OK. Nothing will happen. We won't go in um, and change anything, but um, it'll just be easier for you if you just leave that blank. So please try to do that. Um, last thing I want to point out is that uh, you have to set up a current billing account. Um, I noticed when I was checking registration, most people have enough credits to run, run this workspace easily. Um, so it will default to using your AOU initial credits if you have them. If you don't, um, hopefully you set up a GCP billing account of some kind that's functional. You can find that by clicking this and then clicking your name and clicking allow. And if you set it up right, you should see some other options that show up here. So for example, you can see four billing accounts I have set up. These are all gray because they're no longer active and I, used them, I was using them for demonstration purposes. But if you do have active ones, they should be black and you should select them. So just keep that in mind. Um, you'll then need to fill out research use statement questions that I sort of mentioned in the about section. These will show up there and you can edit them after. So keep that in mind if your you know, project changes in some way. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through every single detail. I'd recommend just leaving them as they are because um, uh, the authors did a good job explaining what, what the workspaces are and what they're used for. Uh, but I want to point out a few things that might be useful when you're creating your own workspaces. Um, so for example, you'll have to fill out the primary research purpose of your project, a summary of, uh, I guess an additional summary by responding to these specific questions, right? Um, Things I want to point out that might be more useful in the future for you, you might have questions about is questions five and six. So if you're studying any kind of underrepresented population, um, you can absolutely do that. There's no issue with that. But if you do so, we ask you to click yes when you're doing and click click yes and then select the ones that you're looking for. Uh, this featured workspace will be focusing on height, which is not an underrepresented population. So we're going to click no. But just keep that in mind for if you're creating a workspace in the future. Uh, finally, if you want to request a review of your research purpose description by your resource access board, um, if you want to have that option, feel free to do so, um, especially if you have answered yes to five, though not exclusively. Um, for the purposes of this, du of this duplicating workspace, we don't have any concern about, about potential stigmatization, but um, basically, if you have any concerns about stigmatizing a group based on your study, you'll probably want to click yes and have the resource access board um, review it. You can still work in it while they're reviewing it, so it won't shouldn't impede your um, research, but just keep that in mind. So as again, I'm going to click no, um, and I would encourage everyone here to click no for this duplicate workspace. Then we'll click duplicate workspace, confirm, and it should spin up within about 30 seconds to a minute. One thing I want to quickly point out while we're uh, while I'm waiting is that people often ask, you know, what are the credits actually being used for? Everything that I've shown you thus far does not cost anything. So when you log in, it costs you nothing. You won't burn through your credits that um, you get when you first sign up. You get $300 in free credits. They never go away unless they're utilized for compute or storage. The only time they're ever actually used is when you're spinning up an environment or you're storing files in, one of your, in your workspace that you generate your environment. So when you're using the core and data set builder, you shouldn't have any issue um, with that. Like that won't cost anything. Also just browsing the main page won't actually cost you anything. Uh, as in uh, creating workspaces also should not cost you anything either. So um, yeah, this should hopefully spin up in the next you know, 30 
30 seconds or so. Um, then I'll try again. Uh, you know, let me quickly look through, see if there's any questions that are open. Looks like the parts. Okay, perfect. So started. Um, one thing I want to point out is that when you create a control tier workspace, which will change to all registered tier and control tier workspaces probably in the near future, we get this nice pop up that shows up that gives you some resources that you might want to check out that will be helpful for your research. So, for example, where to pull the genomic data from is one of the files you can look at. You know, I'd encourage people to check these out. Um, this will take you to the support of with those specific pages. It's really helpful. Um, if you want to see them when you you know, come back to your workspace, you can leave this and not click it off. But if you don't want to see it anymore, just feel free to click that X and it won't show up anymore. Um, Genevieve will get into the specifics of why you're choosing this, but just because it takes some time, um, I'm going to suggest that everyone start up, start up a cloud environment here. So it usually takes five to 10 minutes to get set up initially. Um, we'll be utilizing a Hale Genomics Analysis Environment versus a General Analysis Environment. So make sure you click Hale Genomics Analysis Environment um, it'll default to the standard disk, which you can leave, and then click Create. And then within five to 10 minutes, that should be spun up. Um, sort of concludes the tour slash exercise. So um, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. And um, if we want, we can get people into the breakout rooms where we can you know, do this together. OK, yeah, I will send everyone out to breakout rooms. And there should be a TA in every room. And if there's not, if the TAs could just move around and make sure that they're um, in, in a room without any other TAs, that would be great. OK, here we go. Yes, so it looks like we're going to focus on the rest of today is the basics of these notebooks. And I'll be sharing my screen so that everyone can follow along. And I'll get. I'm going to get started. Remember, everyone, please post questions in the Q&A. Um, use the chat to um, for links and to share, you know, information. But generally, if you have questions, go ahead and post that in the Q&A. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, can everyone see? The researcher workbench here? Yes, good to go. Awesome. Okay, so I think we are going to update our agenda slightly. So this is what we had today that we were going to be doing exercise. We did exercise one, but we're still stuck on some of those sections. And so exercise two, three, and four, we're going to introduce those and talk about what you need to know in order to run them. And then we'll actually run them tomorrow because they don't actually take very long to run. It's just a lot of content to understand. So we'll focus on getting everyone understanding what these notebooks are and how they can use them. And I think that we will be good to go. Um, OK, so I next we're going to talk about cloud environments. And so when we, when some of you were successfully able to duplicate the, duplicate the notebook and, or duplicate the, the workspace, and then some of you started a cloud environment, I wanted to go into more depth about what a cloud environment is. So as Chris was saying earlier, in order to analyze the All of Us data, we need to run analyses in this analysis tab with Jupyter Notebooks or other applications that we have on the researcher workbench. And in order to run these notebooks or other applications, we are going to use cloud environments. And all the information about a cloud environment is over here on this right-handed panel. This has information about your workspace and about the cloud. So you can click here. It's the menu that we used before with this duplicate button that we're all mad at right now. And help tips, workspace storage, data dictionary. 
And then what I'm going to focus on is this application button. This is all of the different, different applications that you can run in a workspace. There is Jupyter and then there is Cromwell. We are using Jupyter for our exercises. It is a really common application that many of our researchers use and really it has a lot of options for running analyses. Cromwell is really great if you're going to scale up your analysis and run batch workflows. We're not doing that today, but it is a really helpful um, integrated application in the workspace. So Jupyter has both notebooks and a terminal. So you can start a Jupyter Cloud environment and run those Jupyter notebooks or the terminal by clicking here. Okay, so when you want to start a Jupyter notebook, okay, I'm getting an unknown error, let me refresh. It is loading. So let me see. Maybe one of my workspaces from yesterday has this. Hmm. Is anyone else seeing this problem? Yes, me too. I am concerned that we have caused major problems on the workbench. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so after a little bit, it finally loaded. So I was going into this Jupyter Cloud Analysis Environment button here. So this is your environment configuration panel where you can select all of the options that you want for your analysis. And it has two major sections, the top part is all about your compute profile, and then the bottom is about storage. So there are two different recommended environments. There is the HALE genomics analysis and then the general analysis. The general analysis is what we need for the all of the notebooks that are not HALE run fine with the general analysis. So that's exercise two exercise three and exercise five, all you need is a general analysis. So if you wanna use HALE, you need to use the HALE genomics analysis. And at the top of this environment configuration panel are estimates for cost. So it has the cost when running, the cost when paused, and then the storage cost per month if you keep it active. So this, when you're spinning up a cloud environment, you're spinning up a virtual machine with specific parameters that you select here. So right now you can see this button says that the environment is paused. And if I click, if I click play, it will resume. And right now I have, this is a general analysis environment. So you can see the CPUs I have are four and the RAM is 15. And I think I saw a question earlier about how to decide how much, how much compute power to give to your analysis. And this is something that you can actually adjust after you start your environment. So if you need more compute power, you can add more compute power, which is great. One thing that is only available in the general analysis environment is our GPUs. So if you wanna use GPUs for machine learning or powerful analysis, you need to use the general analysis. And 
Um, there are two different compute types. There's a standard VM and there's a data proc cluster. So when you pull up the Hale genomics analysis, it actually opens up a data proc cluster compute type, which has more settings for the different, for more uh, virtual computers that you're going to be starting as part of that cluster. And so we're going to stick with the general analysis. And then also a hot tip is how, um, how fast your automatically pause will happen. So on the second half of this cloud environment panel, you have your storage options. So when you do a general analysis environment, oops, I didn't mean to open that. When you do a general analysis environment, it's going to use by default a reattachable persistent disk. And a reattachable persistent disk, it's like a detachable flash drive and you can, you can delete your environment but keep the persistent disk. So this is really helpful if you are doing analyses where you want to save your work and you want to access it later. Whereas when you use the Hale genomics analysis, because it uses this data proc cluster, it by default starts the standard disk. And a standard disk is more similar to temporary storage because when you delete your environment, you also delete the standard disk and you can't access those results. Thankfully, all of this data is within all this um, virtual computer is within your workspace bucket. And so you can save your files, even if you just have a standard disk, you can save those analysis files to your workspace bucket and you can access them later. You just have to make sure you're saving your files in the right place because it's not at as default. Uh, I did want to highlight that you can adjust this cloud compute profile after you start, but you can't change the compute type, the standard VM or the cluster. You have to stick with what you have already chosen and you can't change the disk that you're using. And you will also see that if you're using the persistent disk and you change the size, so let's say I change this to 300, you'll see that the persistent disk cost in order to store it every month is a lot more expensive. Whereas if you change your CPUs or your RAM, that's gonna cost more when it's running and more when paused. So there are the basics of how to decide what you wanna do for your cloud environment. These recommended environments are a really great place to start. And then if you're running your analyses, and you wanna change it using, using the cloud, it's really easy to change the resources you're using and, um, and be able to do the analysis you need to do. Um, okay, so we are running these in environments in order, I'm gonna go ahead and resume my environment to see if that'll start. Okay, reattachable persistent disk. Okay, it, so you can see that now we have another spinning wheel. This one does take longer, so I won't expect it to be ready immediately. And we are gonna use that Jupyter environment in order to be able to use these Jupyter notebooks. And Jupyter notebooks are a free open source active web tool. If you haven't used them before, you can combine text with code blocks where you can run various codes. These Jupyter notebooks can be R or Python. They, these ones, you can see that they are Python, IPYNB. Um, and then in the Python code, you can run other tools as well. So next, this exercise is called looking at the genomic data. And I know not everyone has that open and ready to go, but we are now going to, we, we don't need to run it immediately. It's a very quick exercise. And so instead we'll move over to the slides and I will show you some more information about the genomic data. Okay. 
I wanted to pause here. I don't think I have time for people to come off mute, but is there anything from the Q&A that I should ad address now from any of the TAs? Okay, I'll assume that we are ready to learn more about the genomic data. Okay, so uh, this next set of slides, we are going to start with the same overview that Michael shared before. So this has the counts for all of the different data sets in the version seven release, which was released back in May, I believe. This is the newest release, and we usually do a release almost every year. And we have over 400,000 survey participants. And of those survey participants, we have over 300,000 participants with genomic data. So the most that we have are array data, but we have a 245,000 whole genome sequences for available for analysis, which is a huge number of participants. And this is increasing every time we release more data. So the next data release most likely will be sometime in 2024, and it'll have even more participants to analyze. New this year were the structural variants and the long read sequences, which we'll talk about more later. But the structural variants are um, the uh, they are the same data set as the whole genome sequences. The 245,000 whole genome sequences we have short variants, which are SNPs and indels for those 245,000 participants, and so 11,000 participants we have structural variants for those people, and then the long read sequences we have a thousand samples with a different type of sequencing, which is long read whole genome sequencing. I wanted to plug these amazing resources that our team has created because we have so many files available. We want to have anything that our, that our researchers need in order to analyze the data. And so we provide many different uh, file formats that the data is available in. So there are two different resources that you can use to find out if we have the data that you need. One is called How the All of Us Genomic Data Are Organized, and that is a resource that describes the file formats and also describes what data is available for what data set, whereas this controlled CDR directory doc, that has the specific file paths for the genomics data. And that is something we'll actually pull up when tomorrow we get into exercise two in order to access the genomic data from the terminal. So this is how the genomic data are organized. They are organized in data sets of the type of data. So there's the array data. There are the small variants, SNP and indel, for the short read whole genome sequences. And then there are structural variants for those short read whole genome sequences. And then the other type of sequencing we have are the long read whole genome sequences. And for all of those data, we have raw data, we have variant data. And I wanted to highlight with the long read whole genome sequences, that includes both small variants, SNP and indels, and also structural variants there too. Today, today and for this workshop, we are focusing on the short read whole genome sequences because it has the most data available so that we can do a full analysis with HALE and we have the data set is huge. We have over 245,000 participants. The SNP and indel variants make this a huge data set so that it is not easily analyzable in VCF or HAIL matrix table format. And so the whole data set is published in a new data type called the HAIL VDS. And that is where all of the variants and all of the participants are, are in that data set but it is somewhat difficult to use and you do need to subset it in order to do further analysis downstream in either VCF or Hale matrix table format. And so in order to save everyone money and since people use 
very similar regions of the genome. We have three smaller call sets that we created subsetting this Hale v VDS over three different genomic regions. And this contains all participants that are in the VDS. So this is the ACAF threshold, the exome, and the ClinVar data sets. The ACAF threshold is our, um, our common variants with high AC or AF in specific populations. And then the exome variants are variants within the exome. And then ClinVar are variants that are in the ClinVar database. One of the other reasons we're using this short read whole genome sequencing data set is that there's excellent auxiliary data. There's the variant annotation table, which are functional annotations of all of the variants in the data set. There's also ancestry information um, for all of those samples. And then there are there's relatedness and variant calling metrics. The relatedness is helpful to note because when you're doing the GWAS, it's important that you do not have uh, highly related um, samples within the same data set. So we published a list of non-related um, list of samples so that we can use that when we are doing our GWAS analysis. Okay, so there are two ways to access the genomic data. And I know some of you have started to use the researcher workbench and probably have used some of these methods. So the first way is the genomic data extraction tool. So this uses the cohort builder, which Chris talked about earlier, where you build groups of samples and then you can extract BCF files of those subset of samples though the subset of samples needs to be under 5,000 participants. So this is really easy to use if you are using a smaller data set. However, for today, we are gonna be directly accessing the files using that list of file paths in the CDR directory doc. So in those Jupyter notebooks, it shows you how to use GSUtil to access the data that is on the cloud. Um, and so we can do the GWAS. Okay, so this is, uh, this is exercise two. I am going to give an introduction, but I wanna leave enough time so that Jennifer can introduce us to a GWAS. And then we'll probably spend the last few minutes talking about uh, what we all, what we can do before our next session tomorrow. So going back, to the notebook, here is exercise two. Okay, so it is still spinning up. Sometimes it does take a longer amount of time to create a cloud environment. What usually doesn't take very long is duplicating, so that's why we had that issue. But um, sometimes it does take a while to start your cloud environment, so you wanna start it a bit before you're ready to actually get started. But if you can see when you open a notebook, it opens in preview mode and you don't actually have to have a you don't have to have a cloud environment started in order to see your notebook in preview mode it is really helpful in case you open the wrong notebook so you immediately know that that's not what you're looking for and you can also use preview mode in order to share your results with your collaborators so this, uh, this notebook, which is exercise two, has five different sections. And when you open it in edit mode and you can run the notebook, you can see those five sections. But first we are going to, for people that are new to Jupyter Notebooks, you can get started with practicing inserting and deleting cells. And there are, um, there are some practice sections here. So we'll do this tomorrow so that everyone can get familiar with the Jupyter Notebook. So this notebook only needs the default general analysis environment. And so we can save our data to the persistent disk like we were talking about before, which is the cloud environment storage that you can save after you delete your cloud environment. But uh, we find that if you are 
accessing your data from hail in, uh, a hail environment, or you just want to save your data in the workspace in general so that more people can access it than just you, you can use the workspace bucket. And the workspace bucket, let me zoom in so everyone can see better. So the workspace bucket is one of the environment variables that are available on the researcher workbench. And the researcher workbench has a lot of different environment variables. One thing to note that I find to be really helpful is this CDR directory doc that I was talking about earlier, where it lists the file paths for all of the genomic data. It also lists the environment variables. So there's the top level directory of the CDR storage path. The VDS path is WGS VDS path. And then the exome hail matrix table, here is the path here. So these are all built in to your Jupyter notebooks on the researcher workbench. They're already available so that you can access these easily. So we're saving here the workspace bucket and accessing it with this environment variable called workspace bucket, saving it in this variable called bucket. We print it out and we can see that this is the location of the workspace bucket. Next is a command for listing the objects that are in the bucket. We'll be able to look at that more closely tomorrow. And then Again, to highlight these environment variables, here is that same one, WGS exome split hail path. And we can see that that pulls up the genomic data location right here. Later in this notebook, we're using the GSUtil tool to access the data on the cloud and list all of the data that is in that bucket. So when we list, we use GSUtil, and we give our Google project, and then we list the WGS exome split hail path. We can see here all of the files that are in that bucket that represent the hail matrix table data. So that is a preview of exercise two, and I am next going to hand over the mic to Jennifer, and Jennifer is going to get us started on how to understand GWAS and what those next notebooks look like for our exercises tomorrow. Full oh, screen. So uh, we suppose so we supposed to have a hands-on uh, project uh, running GWAS in a research workbench, um, and then before getting into that. I want to uh, give a brief introduction of GWAS, like what is a GWAS and how to perform it in a research workbench. Um, so the full name of GWAS is whole genomes, uh, is genome-wide association study. Uh, it is a study that looks for associations between genetic vari variants and, and the traits for disease or disease across the entire genome. So. Um, it is looking for variants that are associated with a phenotype. So some of you may have also heard of FIWAS. Uh, FIWAS is also a, an association study, but it is looking for uh, uh, phenotypes that are associated with a specific variant. So for a GWAS, uh, there is uh, one phenotype and multiple variants. For a FIWAS, uh, there is one variant and multiple phenotypes. So that is the difference. And for today's project, uh, we choose GWAS so that you can uh, you can practice working with both the phenotype data and the genomic data and with the folks on the genomic data. Um, so now we know the definition of GWAS, and we can see, uh, we can imagine there are several steps to perform a GWAS in the research workbench. So 
both phenotypic data and the genomic data are involved in the GWAS. That means we need to get the phenotypic data from the research workbench, and then we need to get the uh, genomic data uh, from the research workbench. And probably we need to perform some very simple uh, sample QC and the variant QC. And then we need to link the phenotypic data to the genomic data. And uh, after we link those data types together, we will need to have a model building. Uh, normally for a GWAS, uh, if it depends on the, the, the type of your phenotype, your phenotype can be categorical and can be continuous. If it is uh, categorical, we normally build a logistic regression uh, model. And if, it, if the phenotype is continuous trait, uh, then we may want to build a linear regression model. And finally, we may want to visualize the result uh, for your publications or for your presentation. And now uh, here comes that that is the very general steps to perform a GWAS. Um, so how we do that in the research workbench uh, today? So in the, the today's GWAS, uh, we will use a height uh, as the phenotype, and we will use the uh, short read whole genome sequencing data uh, as the gen genomic data. So I also use a query here to get the phenotypic data. Uh, that is because uh, the phenotypic data are stored uh, in the big query in the OGAS dataset database. That is a little bit different from the genomic data. The genomic data are stored in the Google bucket. You can just access them uh, using uh, the path to the genomic data. But to get the phenotypic data, you need to uh, write SQL code to your query from BigQuery. And the good thing is that you don't have to know uh, SQL code or even like, because we have a, a cohort uh, and data set builder that is a point and click tool to help you uh, get uh, the SQL code. This is very convenient and very simple to use and it is free. You don't have to have an uh, active environment in your workspace, uh, you can still use it. So, um, so I think even if you don't have uh, a um, active environment today, I can still show you how to use the cohort and the data set builder to prepare for the exercise three. Okay, let me stop. Let me share my. Um, can you still see my screen uh, for the research workbench? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's great. So uh, just uh, doesn't matter if you don't, if you're not finished, uh, successfully uh, finished duplicating the official workspace uh, or copy the notebook to your any uh, control tier workspace, uh, you can still follow me to use the cohort and the data set builder. And uh, what you need to do is just to click on any uh, control tier workspace. If you see a CT batch here, uh, click on this workspace. And then you will see three uh, tabs here and your data analysis and about. Uh, we tab. And as we mentioned, we, what we want to do is to use the cohort and data set builder to uh, get the phenotype data. What is the phenotype data we need? We, uh, as we said, we, we want to get the height. That is the phenotype we need. And what is the cohort? The cohort is the participant who has short read whole genome series data. So that means we want to get the height value for the people who have short read whole genome sequencing data. So let's get started. And you can follow me. As I said, it's free. If you, even if you don't have an active environment in your workspace, you click on, let's go back. You click on the plus button here, cohort, 
and add criteria. And we have some pre-built uh, cohort for you. So for example, we can just uh, scroll down, uh, select short read whole genome sequencing data. And that is the cohort for the participant who have short read whole genome sequencing data. And we can see the total count is uh, more than 245,000. And we can see some uh, basic uh, demogra demographics of this cohort. And as I said, I also need uh, the height value for this uh, cohort. So we want to uh, include the participant who have uh, had a value in this database. So then we search for height in the second group. And we scroll down, we see there's a physical measurement. And then we click on it and then we select it. And we don't want to exclude any participant here. And then we just add this and then save criteria. Now we say that uh, we have less people. We have 245,000 uh, participants here. And then we can also see some, the race distribution and the uh, age uh, distribution. And then we create a cohort. So we name it as short read WGS and height. And you can also add some descriptions here to remind you later on if you want to use this uh, cohort. We save. And now we create a cohort. We can view this actually uh, data. So this is the cohort we created. Uh, so these are the cohort in the featured workspace I created before. So the thing is, if you duplicate a workspace, uh, the cohort, uh, the concept and data set that are uh, created in that workspace will be duplicated to your uh, own workspace as well. So this short read, uh, whole genome sequencing and height uh, cohort is the cohort that we just created. And then we, uh, one thing I want to specify is that uh, the cohort builder the purpose of the cohort builder is just to group a certain uh, a certain participants. You, uh, after fi finishing this step, you actually didn't get any uh, value, didn't data set from the database. So you need to use the data set uh, builder to get the any values you need for this cohort. So even person ID, some people may think, oh, I've already created a cohort. I may have the person ID for this cohort. So this is not correct. Uh, we need, even for the person ID, we need to use the data set builder to get the person ID for the cohort you created. So we click on data set. And in the first column, we select short read the cohort we just created and then we uh, so we we want to uh, select a concept. So as I said, we need height in this concept, but we don't know we we couldn't find it here. So now we uh, can create our own concept. We search for height, and uh, we click on the physical measurements and select height and finishing review and save concept set. Um, I will create a new set, just name it as height and save. And now we, let's go back to the data tab. We'll see that we have the cohort and we have the concept set created. And now we can create our data set. So you see the cohort is here and the concept set is here. And now you can select the values you need uh, from the database. Normally I would just deselect all and that is the person ID 
uh, you need. And that is the, and I will also select uh, value as number. That is the height. And we want to know the unit of this value. So that is the unit concept name and we create data set. So name it as a uh, short read WGS height and save. And then we create data set. So you can just name it as Uh, let me see, short read WGS height and save. And so while you are practicing in the uh, breakout rooms, you can still uh, view the preview, uh, preview table. This will show you the first several rows of this uh, data set you queried from the database. And now you can analyze it. So this will generate the SQL code I mentioned. Uh, in a slide for you to query the data from the database. It is very simple and convenient to use. And so uh, if you have any uh, notebook uh, in your workspace, you can just uh, select uh, any notebooks you want to add this code into your existing workspace, or you can name it, you can get a new uh, notebook to store this code and I just click on export or even just copy all the code uh, to any cell you like. Um, so I think that's uh, all I want to show to use the cohort and the data set builder and then I will click on the uh, access three to create a phenotype. Uh, so this is the code. Uh, I used the cohort and the data set builder uh, to generate it, to query the height value for the short read whole genome sequencing participants. Um, since we can practice this, I will just uh, briefly go through this notebook uh, to show you what it does um, so that you can get into more details uh, tomorrow. So for any notebook, if you want to run it, you need to spin, spin up and uh, cloud analysis environment. So it is not free. It not free like using a cohort and data set builder. So you need to have a uh, active analysis uh, analysis environment. For this notebook, uh, the general analysis environment is enough to to run the whole notebook. So I will just select this general analysis environment and then. Uh, next for create. So, and uh, basically this notebook is doing is to uh, like to use the cohort and data set builder to query uh, the height value we need from the database. And uh, then we will uh, practice some pandas uh, function to explore the data set or the data frame we queried from the database and we'll probably do some simple QC here and uh, then or then some plot function. And or last, we will save uh, the data set uh, to your current analysis environment uh, or to your workspace bucket so that you can use it next time even if you delete your current analysis environment here. Um, I think I can uh, still have some time to go through each step of this uh, notebook and so that you can have more understanding of it. And when you practice, you can have a, a deeper 
you can, if you have any questions, we can come back to discuss this tomorrow. And let me see. So as I said, uh, in this notebook, you will learn how to use the cohort and data set builder to uh, get your cohort and data set. You will know how to explore your pandas data frame to practice some pandas uh, functions. And you will know how to save uh, your data set to your current analysis environment and workspace bucket. And uh, after you practice uh, like uh, the cohort data set builder run a notebook, you may want to answer some of the questions. So rem uh, remember these questions while you are uh, exploring this uh, notebook. And this is just a setup. So normally we want to record uh, how much time uh, we it takes to run a notebook uh, so that you can probably uh, estimate the cost uh, for part of your project. And uh, so uh, in case you uh, forgot uh, how to use the cohort data set builder, we also have a text, written text to show you step by step to use the cohort and the data set builder to query uh, the height of value from uh, the database. Uh, after you successfully created uh, the database, uh, the data set, and you can just copy the code uh, and paste in the cell below. below. Um, so after you run it, you will see how many rows are there in this data set. And we just make a copy of this uh, data set. And you will see it is a pandas data frame. And then we, uh, we have some functions for you to uh, explore the data frame. You can get uh, the header, like the column names of this data frame. You can get uh, how many rows and how many columns are there in this data frame. And you can get the data type, the value uh, type of each column. And so you can also explore some columns of interest. And uh, for example, here, uh, we can get uh, the frequency of each unique value in the column uh, unit uh, concept name. And also we want to do some simple sample QC to remove the rows that uh, do not have a meaningful uh, unit concept name. And we can get some basic stats uh, of the height uh, in this cohort. So we'll use the describe function. And then we may also want to have a simple uh, histogram plot to get the distribution of the height of this uh, cohort. And now uh, we can save uh, this data frame to your current analysis environment. Use this function to uh, CSV. And now uh, we can use this command ls to check if this file is saved. Uh, we can see that it's saved here. And so if you are using a uh, general analysis environment, this will save to your persistent disk. So next time, uh, if you spin up the same uh, general analysis environment, this file will still exist uh, in your uh, analysis environment or in your virtual machine. And but we, if you want to access uh, this uh, file from other workspace, or if you are using a HaleNest environment and you want to use it next time, so you want you may want to save uh, this file to your workspace bucket, and then we use this function, the GS Util. Um, Jennifer just introduced. Uh, copy this file to your workspace bucket, and then we can check if this file is saved to to your workspace bucket. We can see here that the file is here and it's just to show how much time it costs to run the whole notebook. Um, so that is for exercise three. Um, if you successfully run the notebook, you should have the phenotype file uh, saved uh, to your workspace. And so that is uh, the preparation for the next step to run the GWAS uh, in the research workbench. Um, so the next step is to 
is in exercise four. So exercise four. I think, Jennifer, uh, yep. before, um, I think we should spend some time covering the wrap up um, so that we can get everyone started and then we'll jump into all the exercises active and go go into more detail of exercise four tomorrow, which is exercise four where we run the Hale GWAS. So. Uh, yes. So uh, everything we learned today will prepare us into run the G, uh, Hale GWAS in the research workbench. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so this recording will be posted so that if you miss any of it, if we're running too fast, or if you want to share with people who missed this workshop, it'll be available to access. Okay, so here is our up-to-date agenda for day two so that we can continue with where we were at yesterday. So yesterday we introduced exercise two and exercise three, but we didn't start running those and um, working on them in the breakout room. So that's where we're gonna start do a little recap of those exercises, talk more about genomic data types. And then exercise three and four are all about running the GWAS. And Jennifer is going to jump into that and explain all about running a GWAS. And then finally, we are going to talk about extra confounding variables in order to set up an advanced GWAS. And those will have exercises that you can either run now or run at home, depending on how much time we have. And we will leave plenty of time for Q&A so that we can make sure everyone is feeling comfortable and ready to analyze their data. Next, we are going to jump in. Oh, actually, before I do that, uh, let me see, what do I want to do first? Let's, yeah, let's do the other genomic data topics first. Okay. Okay, so we went over this slide a couple times yesterday because it gives us an idea of where we can start when we want to analyze genomic data. And today we're going, I wanted to highlight some of the exciting updates with the structural variants and the long read sequences, because those are all those are both new this year. So we have 11,390 samples for structural variants, and these are all whole genome sequences. So the short read whole genome sequences, and we have 11,000 of those that have additional structural variants in addition to the small variants. And we have a thousand long read sequences, and those are also new this year, which we are building both of these data sets to include many more of the participants that have the short read whole genome sequences. Okay, so first to go over some of the interesting details about structural variants. So we worked with our collaborators who have created the GATK SV pipeline, and this 11,390 uh, sample call set is one of the largest SV call sets ever. It is available in VCF format, which makes it easy to analyze. And some of the interesting features of this call set that may be interesting to you if you haven't used SVs before is that we do have sexploity information and we have samples with aneuploidies. And these structural variants include multiple variant classes, including copy number variants, insertions, inversions, complex rearrangements, and more. So there are a lot of really um, interesting variants that you can find in that call set. And yeah, like I said before, it's available in BCF format. Okay, so long read whole genome sequencing, very exciting, really happy that we are able to provide this in the All of Us data set. So this, these are PacBio Pac Hi-Fi reads, which has a 17 kilobase read length average comparison to the short reads, which are 150 base pairs. And so the long read data allows for discovery of regions of the genome that short reads do not. 
And then this is one of the long, largest call sets, again, of long read samples ever generated. It's definitely the largest of non-European participants because all of the samples are from participants who self-reported as African-American. And there's an inclusion of a long read selector in the cohort builder. So like Jennifer was describing earlier, you can uh, select for just phenotype information that applies to samples with long read info. And there's also a featured workspace so that you can better understand how to work with long reads data. For anyone who is not familiar with long read sequencing, here is a helpful information graphic about the difference between short read and long read. So short read sequencing has many different sequences that are pasted together in order to create the alignment. And so the, it's, the missing sequence data leads to gaps in the genome. And so it's much harder to, to find um, longer variants and structural variants. So with long reads with this 17, 17 kilobase base pair sequences, we're able to get a lot more information about large variants um, in particular. This uh, table highlights the amount of data that is, that is available for every long read sample. So they have two reference versions. One is the T to T reference, and then the other is the GRCH38 um, with no alternate sequences that more um, generally matches the short read sequences if you want to do comparisons. We have raw data and BAM files for both of these references. And then we have haplotype assemblies in both FASTA and GFA um, format. And then we used many different tools to call variants. We used deep variant, PAV, PBSV, and sniffles. And so there are single sample SNP and indel VCFs. There are single sample structural variant VCFs. We have joint called VCFs for those um, small variants. And we have a joint called Hale matrix table for um, ease of um, ease of research with HAIL. So this just um, identifies some of the great opportunities for genomic data analysis um, past some of the most widely used data sets. Um, oh yeah, so we talked about yesterday briefly about the variant annotation table, which we also call the VAT. And this provides functional annotations for all of the high quality variants in the call set. So we do filter um, for sites that have uh, less than 50 alternate alleles and also that they pass all of the filtering. So you're going to see in there um, gene symbol and protein change functional information. And this is, uh, this is delivered as a tab separated text file that can be loaded into HAIL. And we have a detailed description of that tab separated file and what information is in there. Um, and functional annotations can really help to understand the impact of the genes, transcripts, or genomic regions that, um, that you find um, in your research. And then they can also help to filter and group variants or you can look for multi-factor, multi-genic effects. And I did want to note that we're, the tool that we use for most of our functional annotations is Nirvana. And so this uses sequence ontology consequences and external data sources. So we use Nomad, Splice AI, and ClinVar. OK, so that is an overview of the other genomic data types. I wanted to pause and see if there are any questions here. OK, so I am going to next move on to a recap of yesterday in exercise two. OK. So to get started, I know we went over this yesterday, but the, the main website that you want to go to when you're logging into the researcher hub is researchallofus.org or you can directly go to workbench.researchallofus.org sign in here i assume a lot of you all are already signed in 
and I already have it open over here, so I'm not going to sign in again. But if you go to your, I don't want to re reopen this. So if you go to your home page, this is what you should see. You should see all your workspaces that are available. And I did want to note that this featured workspace that we are using here, all the featured workspaces can be found on this menu on the left. And this is the featured workspace we're using today. Genomics Workshop, July 2023. And one thing to note is that this workspace has all of the TAs as owners here. And so when you do go ahead and duplicate this workspace, it has this option to share the workspace with the same set of collaborators. And generally, especially if you're, you're cloning a featured workspace, you don't want to select that because you don't want other people that you're not working with to see your data. So if you selected this and you see that you're sharing your workspace with a bunch of the TAs, go ahead and um, remove those people from your collaborators. And I believe um, this is, you can do it when you're the owner. So um, if you go into the about page, you're able to see who is the owner. So right now it's just me, which is what I want because I want this, this research to be my own, but I can also share if necessary. So yeah, go ahead and remove any collaborators if you did share it with any of the, if the original collaborators, and then that will um, make things easier for everyone. So that we also as TAs, if we have like, 100 workspaces, it makes it very hard to find the ones we're looking for. Um, okay, so here in this workspace, you'll find the data tab, and the data tab is where you can access the cohort builder and where you can access the data set builder. And like Jennifer was describing yesterday, this tool is free to use. You don't need to start an environment to run this tool. You do need to start a cloud environment to run tools on the analysis tab. And you can for running for starting a for starting a cloud environment, you do need to have credits. So one thing I did want to highlight, we, I know there were some questions yesterday about credits. You can always check your balance here. So I'm still on my all of us initial credits, which is great, which you have 300 and I've used $92 and I have $200 remaining. You can also see your data access here. Okay, so let's go back to this, my clone of the featured workspace, and we are going to go into exercise two. We went through this yesterday looking at preview mode, but we didn't go into depth on the edit mode. So when you go into edit mode, you are able to actively run the workspace and save your changes. So because there's a lot of us here, it might take a few minutes to connect to the notebook server. I'm okay, while that is loading, I will go through the, the commands that we have here. So this is the setup, these are the setup commands. So we have from, we have um, loading what time it is so that we can see how long it takes to run the notebook. That's really helpful if you're estimating cost. Okay, so next we are importing functions. This is also a standard set of code that you can copy from featured workspaces or you can also copy from the code snippet. Next, we talked about yesterday environment variables, which are variables that are already available in Researcher Workbench in order to access commonly used buckets or commonly used resources. So here we are printing our workspace bucket, and that is what it looks like here. And then this is 
a code snippet that you can find if you look at the code snippets that are available where you print the, the resources or the, the files that are in your workspace bucket. So here it is pulling in the variable that we found above. Zoom in a little bit. So bucket is the environment variable workspace bucket. So here we use bucket in order to print all of the objects. And you can see we have the notebooks, but we also have data that we saved. So Manhattan plot that is um, in one of the Jupyter notebooks later. And we also have the results that Jennifer was talking about in one of the other notebooks. And then we also have environment variables. So here is the CDR storage path environment variable, which is the highest level bucket uh, AOU data sets controlled V7. And then here we're printing the environment variable WGS exome split hail path. And like I went over yesterday, the genomic data paths and those environment variables are available in this article. So you can see the data set, the bucket location, and then the environment variable. So you can easily access that. In the next set of code blocks, we are listing the files that are in each of those environment variables. So in the CDR storage path, this v V7, is, we copied that right here. And this is what's available. There are the array data and there's the WGS data. And here we're using GSUtil in order to list our exome split hail path. So here's a different way to use the environment variable. And here are the exome data, data set files. So we are going to break up into breakout rooms now and dis discuss the questions for exercise two. So those are right here. There are three questions. How does a Jupyter notebook change after being run? What are the environment variables in this notebook? And how would you change the GSUtil command to view the ClinVar smaller call set? So here is the G GSUtil command and fill in what you need for ClinVar. So Chris, if you could break us into breakout rooms and then we'll discuss those questions next. Okay, I think most people are back. So I wanted to just go over the answers to those questions and discuss it as a group. So I'm going to share my screen and here are the questions. So did anyone have an answer to the first one? How does the Jupyter Notebook, how does the Jupyter Notebook change after being run? Um, it shows output after the sales. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, so you can see in the preview mode of this notebook, after the cells are run, you can see the output. And in addition, one other thing to note is you can also notice the in these brackets, there won't be a number if it hasn't been run yet. And then once it's been run, it'll appear with the number of the order that the cells were run in. Okay, so the second question is to list the environment variables that were used in the notebook. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have an answer for this question. Nothing in our group, nothing works, so we will just. So, so. There, are, there are two already here. Google underscore project is one of them, and uh, WJS underscore XOM underscore split is another example. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I saw in the chat some people saying that there's 
their um, notebooks are frozen and that is, yeah, we have been noticing that's the case. Um, you can see this in the preview mode, so we want everyone to be able to follow along. So go ahead and you can use the preview mode and you can see here in the code blocks, we have the workspace bucket here, we have the CDR storage path, we have the WGS exome split hail path, and then if you answer the ClinVar question, you will also see that in your notebook or in um, text. So I know, um, yes, Isan answered the last question. Oh, great, yeah, so it is WGS ClinVar multi hail path. And something we were talking about in my breakout room is there are two types of hail matrix tables for the smaller call sets. One is multi and one is split. It's described in depth in some of those docs, but it just means how the variant um, it appears in the matrix table. So you can use either one of those. Okay, thank you everyone for jumping into our first breakout rooms for this exercise two. And next I am going to hand over the presentation to Jennifer and she is gonna do a deep dive into running a GWAS. And I know not everyone is able to, to run it themselves, but Jennifer will show us how to run it. And if you're if you're currently in a, a spinning stage where everything's trying to load and you're just on another screen trying to get that to run. And so no worries, you can you can um you can let that run or uh, let that sit. And Jennifer is going to share what she's doing and you'll be able to follow along. So don't worry about making sure it's all um, all situated correctly because we will we'll share what we're, we're, we're learning. Okay, Jennifer, over to you. Oh, she's on mute if she's trying to talk. Okay, uh, I think I am sharing my screen of exercise three in my research workbench. Uh, is it correct? Yep, you yeah. get to go. Okay. Awesome. So uh, since we have uh, dive in, dive into the exercise three yesterday, and we walked through cell by cell uh, yesterday. So today, uh, I will give a general overview of this exercise, and then uh, you will uh, go to the breakout uh, sessions to practice. No worries. Uh, you don't need an uh, active environment to do this. If you have any workspace, you will you, it will work. So I will show that in a minute. So this notebook basically uses a cohort and a data set builder to build a cohort and get the data set. And it will uh, practice some Python functions uh, to explore a, a pandas data frame. And you will also uh, learn how to save your data set to your current analysis environment and the workspace bucket. So that is basically the three parts of this notebook. And the first one is just to record how much time it takes to run this notebook. So the, the so our goal for the breakout session is to for you to practice the cohort and the data set builder to run the notebook and answer the following questions. But no worries uh, if you can't uh, run a notebook. Like, don't feel that you have to run a notebook to answer these questions. Uh, we, no matter which stage you are in, we get you covered. So uh, if you have uh, either like any active analysis environment in any control tier workspace with at least right access, so you can practice cohort data set builder and run a notebook, answer pre these questions and ask your own questions. So if you uh, have any control tier workspace with at least right access, and then you can practice the cohort and data set builder and look through the notebooks and output. So since we have put explanations for each cell in the notebook, so you don't have to run a notebook and you can answer just by reading through the notebook and the output, you can answer these pre-asked questions and ask your own question. And for those who don't have any uh, controlled tier workspace with at least right access, uh, you can just 
uh, watch the video on the cohort and data distributor. I think some of my TAs uh, will send a link about the cohort and data distributor video and look through the notebook, uh, the code and output and answer some of the, answer these pre-asked questions and ask your own questions. So now I think we can uh, go to the breakout uh, sessions. Hopefully we have uh, gone through all the questions because in my uh, in my room I went through all the questions but we don't have I don't have time to answer some of other questions. So uh, I think we can briefly over uh, go through the questions. So the first one is I will get person ID of the cohort. Uh, I'm still sharing my screen. No. Uh, no, <laughs> not right now. Yeah. Let me share my screen. So uh, let's briefly go over the questions. The first one is uh, I will get person ID of the cohort after I create a cohort using a cohort and a data set builder. Is this statement true? Um, so I am on the way to answer this question, get into more details <laughs> for this question. Uh, and then the breakout session ends. So does anyone have answer for this? Feel free to unmute because we know it, it in this explanation. And Arthur, we just said that the cohort builder will pull the individuals, but you actually don't get the person ID until you run those SQL codes or like uh, you run the script to generate the person data frame, which will have the person ID of the cohort or the people or individuals that you pulled building using the cohort builder. Yes, that's exactly correct. So the cohort builder is just a group, a bunch of people and save them there. You actually don't get anything from the database. So you need to use the data set builder to uh, get information or get the values for this cohort. And then you export the SQL code you generated from the cohort and data set builder and put them in the notebook and run this, run, run this SQL code, then you will have the data set in your, in your notebook. So that is 100% correct. And then the second question is, how to check if your file or data set is saved in your current analysis environment, uh, workspace bucket, so that you can use it next time? Um, uh, can someone answer this question? or you can just type in the chat. If you just wanna check if it's in your working directory, you can just pass the ls command to shell. Yes, that's correct. And the exclamation will pass this command to shell. That's correct. And how to check if they are in your workspace bucket. Then you just add on the gsutil command before ls, and then you make sure to point to your uh, workspace uh, bucket with the environment variable, and, and if you add additional folders, the rest of the path. Yes, that's awesome. That's 100% correct. So we use this command, gsutil command, to list all the objects, all the files in your workspace bucket. Yes, I see some answers in the chat. Yeah, all are correct. Awesome. So let's go to the third one. Uh, what is this step of GWAS doing and what is the purpose? Uh, does anyone have the answer? Just feel free to unmute. Yeah. We prefer the phenotype data using this step? Yes, that's correct. If you still remember the five steps to perform the GWAS in a research workbench, 
that to create the phenotypic data and load the genomic data, link the phenotypic data to the genomic data, and the model building and the visualization. So this notebook is doing the first step to get your phenotypic data and save it to the bucket so that you can use it next time. That's awesome. Yes, I also see uh, the answer building the phenotype file height. Yes, that's 100% correct. Okay, so I think we are done for exercise three. Let's uh, go to exercise four to run the hill GWAS. That's very exciting. So basically this notebook is doing is to take the phenotype file we just created in exercise three and perform GWAS using hail. And we can see the general steps here to uh, load the genomic data, load the phenotype data, uh, and link the phenotype data to genomic data, model building, visualization, and save results. Exactly the same as the steps we described before. Um, so I will uh, go through the notebook uh, step by step, and then we will go to breakout sessions. Uh, the first one is so as we, you can see this in every notebook, it's just to uh, set up to get the path of your workspace bucket and to record uh, how much time it will take to run this notebook. And I forgot to mention that uh, you will need a hail analysis environment to run your notebook. So to choose that, uh, you can go to your Jupyter Cloud Analysis environment and select hail. So you don't have to do this Right now, you can do it after this workshop to practice this. So you need to make sure that you are in a controlled tier workspace so that you can have the option to choose the hail genomic analysis environment. And so now we import this hail uh, tool. So no worries if you don't know hail, if, if it's the first time you hear hail, you can just see it as pandas, as any modules uh, in Python. It's just like a Python-based uh, function. You just import it and then use it. And so if you are not in a hail analysis environment, you probably, so I'm sure you will receive an error. Or saying that some, some modules can find, it means that you are in the wrong environment. And then we load the genomic data. So as we just learned, we use the environment variables to get a path to the genomic data. So the genomic data we use today uh, is the uh, Kalimba smaller cassette for the short read whole genome sequencing data. And the format of this data is a hail. As Genevieve mentioned, we have uh, two versions of the hail matrix table. One is uh, the split one with only with bi-allelic variants. And the second one is the one with multi-allelic variants. So we will use the split one uh, to uh, save some time, money and cost as well. And so in case you are not uh, in the V7, so make sure, because uh, the environment variables are linked to the versions of your data set. So in case you're not in a V7 control tier workspace, we just hard code this uh, path uh, for this workspace bucket. You can still use this uh, hail matrix table in any control tier workspace, even in a v V6 or V5. And then we use this function, uh, read matrix table to uh, load these uh, matrix table to hail. And now uh, you may want to know what is a hail matrix table and is it the same as the table I've learned like a pandas data frame? So uh, the easiest way to explore it is just to list uh, the content in this matrix table. You will see that it is not a single file, even though you see the name is kind of a single file. It is not a single file, it is a directory. It has all the files here. And you don't have to know all this about, what all this about, because Hale has very like 
uh, straightforward functions for you to analyze this. And also we have this function, empty describe, uh, and we, if you use widget two, it will give an interactive interface to show you what a how a hill matrix table looks like. You can see the hill matrix table as three tables or four tables. So one is global table and the other one is a row table and then one is column table and then it's the entry table. So in the, in the OS uh, matrix table, we don't have the global fields. So we only, so you can see the of us hill matrix table uh, as three uh, different tables. So one table with values for the, for all the rows, the one table with columns, with values for all the columns, the one table with values for all the entries. So I will explain what is the row, what is the column, and what is the entry. And all the, all the three tables are divided into smaller pieces. And each piece has its index stored here so that uh, when you uh, specify your command that I don't want to analyze the whole genome. I don't, I just want to analyze a specific part of this genome. Uh, so Hale can recognize this command and uh, look for the index of the data you want and then just analyze this part so that Hale don't have to go through the whole data set to analyze it. That's why Hale can scale uh, your analysis to analyze a large genomic data set. So that is about the Hill matrix table. So after this workshop, you can explore uh, uh, like what is inside a global row, column, or entries. It just describes uh, what is what it looks like, what is the value types uh, in these fields. And you see this call integer, integer string. I want to get into more details. And you can also, a, a very strict, more simple way to describe all the fields. Because you have the global fields, the name of all the fields, the column fields and the row fields. We have locus and leos. Uh, so I will answer questions after I go over this uh, notebook. And you have this entry name of the entry fields. Just go through this. You don't have to understand it. And then you can, we can use this function, mt.count, to get the number of variants and number of samples in this matrix table. And so since we can't show row level data uh, in this work, uh, like because for public. So now uh, I found a public matrix table in the workspace in the Google bucket. Uh, so, I will use this uh, public uh, matrix table to show you uh, what the rows, what the columns, or the entry fields look like. At the same, we we'll read this public matrix table and we we'll show the first five rows of this uh, matrix table. We see the row key is the locus and the key that is the information for the variant. So basically, everything in the row is information for this uh, for the variant. You will see allele frequency, uh, allele counts, and like all this. I think this is, you can, if you can just read this notebook, you can get uh, this output and just explore it in the breakout sessions. And that is, so we use this function to, we use this function to show the first five columns and so all the columns have information for the participants. So that is different from the row. If you want to get information for the participants, so you use the column. That is, so the key is the column ID, and you will see numbers for the uh, of us hill matrix table. And you have, uh, so after we uh, perform some analysis, you will get more information like the pieces or the phenotype uh, after we uh, uh, like manipulate a little bit more in the following steps. And the next one is to show the, the entry fields. 
the entry fields is like the information for both uh, the variant and the uh, and the participant. So, for example, here we show the genotype. The value here uh, shows means that for this participant, uh, the participant's uh, phenotype at this site is zero zero. Zero zero means uh, homozygous reference. So there's no alternative allele in this participant at this site. So that is uh, the meaning of the uh, entry fields. Okay, so now uh, uh, we just- Hello, can you actually show like how the column count is counted here because you show five columns? Yes, five columns. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So five columns for five participants. No, the one regarding to the, like uh, the top one, the five columns is a lot. So can you explain a little bit like uh, empty public column show five, and then you actually show band matrices, subset imputation, sex imputation, all that. So, so this one, yeah. Here. So this is this information is not included in the all of us data set. That's why I don't explain all of this. Yeah, but then they say sh show the first five columns. Why is this is so many columns? Is this because they are grouped together? Can you? Oh, so the column, the, the column means uh so in the Hilbert table, the column you can just see it as a sample. So I show the information for the first five samples. You see here, one, two, three, four, five, five samples. It's just displaying in a different format. Is it clear? So the row show five and the column show five is the same? Is that it's not the same. Uh, row show five is to show uh, the five uh, variants. variants. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can just replace row. So in your mind, just replace row with, with variants replace column with samples. Okay, Subject. Yes. thank you. Yes. And then we uh, restrict the matrix table to a small region and to speed up an, our analysis. And then we want to do some very simple sample QC. So to remove some samples from the matrix table. So this is the, normally we remove related samples in the matrix table to perform a GWAS. So this file is what uh, uh, Genevieve described. Uh, we have, uh, this is files in the aux auxiliary file. We provided for the short read whole genome sequencing data. We just get a path to this file and import it uh, using hail import table. And, and then we use this function to anti-join columns to remove these samples from the hill matrix table. As you can see that now we have less samples compared with uh, 240 something uh, participants. And then we also want to do some sample QC, a variant QC. So we want to uh, keep variants with minor allele frequency greater than uh, 0.01. And since we have removed some samples from the matrix table, so we want to recompute the allele frequency and we use this function, uh, utilize the uh, genotype field, entry field to compute the allele frequency. And we use this, field, this function filter rows uh, to filter based on the allele frequency value uh, to filter variants. And we can see that there are only around 2,000 variants left in the current matrix table. And now, so we have the QC, the matrix table. We want to load uh, the, the phenotype data we created. Uh, we created in the exercise three. So the same thing, uh, we use this environment variable workspace bucket to get a path to our, our workspace bucket. And then we list the files, just to practice what we have learned. And then we import uh, this uh, phenotype file we created to 
uh, hail use this import table, the same as we import a relatedness file. And now we can link the phenotype data to the genomic data and we'll use annotated columns. So remember that if you want to get or add anything to the samples, we just manipulate the columns. So anything related to the samples are in columns. And we can check uh, if these phenotype data are added to the matrix table. So this is the previous matrix table before we add uh, the phenotype data. We can see that we only have the sample information, that is sample ID uh, for the participant. And after adding the phenotype data, we see that besides the uh, sample ID, we have the phenotype information here. So that is the value as number and the unit concept name, what we created in exercise three. So those are all integrated into the uh, hill matrix table. If you show column, like mtphenol.column.show5, uh, you will get uh, a same table like this. And then the value number and the unit concept name will be here the same uh, format. Um, oh, let me see where we are. So awesome. Now we have a matrix table with phenotype data and genomic data. We want to build a model. And so as I said, for, uh, for GWAS, if your phenotype data is a continuous trait, we build a linear regression model. So with linear regression model, and the Y uh, is the phenotype, like the height of the participants, the value as number, we uh, correlate using the cohort and data set builder, and the genotype, like how many of alternative alleles we have for this participant. And we don't set any covariates here, it's just the intercept. And here we visualize the logistic regression result and then we import the packages we need. And the good thing we just, it's very simple to use, you just plot Manhattan. And the good thing about hail plot is that it is using bokeh to plot. So the result is an interactive plot. You hover up here, it will show you the information about this variant. And the same as a QQ plot, and as the same, you can hover here to get information about this uh, uh, site. And then we want to save the results to your current analysis environment and to your workspace bucket and check if they are saved correctly. And it takes about seven minutes to run this. Okay, so um, I think that's all about this uh, notebook and we can go to the, again, let me emphasize that. So the goal for the, for this breakout session is for you to run the notebook and answer questions below, but don't feel that you have to run this notebook to answer these questions. And no matter which stage you are in, we get it covered. So if you have an active analysis environment or hey, your analysis environment, you can run a notebook and answer the questions or ask your own questions. But for those you don't have an active environment, you can just look through the notebook, read the code and the output. We have explanations for each cell. You can just read this through and answer these questions and ask your own questions. So Chris, I think we can go to the works. We can go to the breakout session for 10 minutes. Okay. If the output of this hail matrix, is it a VCF file that the matrix table that's being generated? No. Um, it's not a VCF file. So it's a totally different format that okay. hail uses in um, th that is unique to hail. But okay. we, do, we, we do really encourage people to use this format, even though it's a little harder to learn originally. Uh, it is much more efficient for bigger data sets and is a really great tool for using cloud data. 
especially to reduce your costs. I know people okay. are looking for tools that are really efficient and this is a, a good one to use. Yeah, Hale's new to me. I just started learning, trying to learn what a VCF was because <laughs> I'm still new to genomics, trying to understand it. But um, okay, I just wanted to know. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so VCF is really nice because you can see the variants and read it very easily, but um, and a Hale matrix table is not quite as simple, but Jennifer's um, commands are, are really helpful to be able to show it. And yeah, I'm also like newer to Hale, so I understand that it's okay difficult to learn at first. I think it's definitely worth it. And I'm really grateful for all, like Jennifer really understands it well and she always explains it really well. So um, yeah, using <laughs> the resources available is definitely helpful. <laughs> So with VCF file, files, there's packages that you can parse. Are you are there things in R packages that you can also parse Hale matrix tables? So currently, Hale is just a Python package. Python. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, because you can turn you can use Hale to turn a Hale matrix table into a VCF or other formats as well. Okay. So if you want to do downstream analysis. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm familiar. I can code in Python, but I'm just longer <laughs> coding in R and more comfortable, but it, that was good to know. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. So I think we can just, for the, uh, I have four or five minutes, so I can just go over the, re, uh, the answer for this question and then mention what we will do for the, we will do for the advanced GWAS, and then I will pass to Genevieve for we'll wrap up for today. So the first, uh, let me share my screen. So the first question is what analysis environment should you choose when you are using HAIL? Uh, so as we mentioned, we use HAIL, uh, genomic analysis environment to use HAIL and make sure you are in the controlled tier work space so that you have this option. And is the HAIL matrix table a single table? Uh, the answer is no, uh, since uh, we showed that even in the uh, even in the in the bucket to store the hill matrix table, it has multiple multiple files here. And then, what are the general steps to run hill GWAS in the Office Research Workbench? Right, that is uh, simple. We uh, mentioned this again and again that you create your phenotype data, you load your genomic data. And then you link your phenotype data to your genomic data, and you perform uh, perform your a uh, model building, okay, either linear regression or logistic regression, and then uh, visualize your result. And so that's for exercise four. And so we also have this for you to practice after this workshop. So as you see, the result for this uh, uh, GWAS is not very um, acceptable because you see the, the number for this QQ plot is very, very high, 100, more than 100. So, um, so we wanted to add just some of the confounding variables that is to add covariates into uh, the model. So we will add age, add sex, and birth uh, to the matrix table while doing the model building. And then we will uh, address the population stratification. So this information is stored in the genetic predicted ancestry. We will get the pieces uh, from this file and then add to the matrix table and then set it as a covariate to uh, build the model. So this will get you a better uh, GWAS result. So as you can see here, uh, the lambda is low, it's from 100 to four. So we improve the GWAS. And so feel free to, and we also have some questions for you and we will send uh, the answer to these questions after this workshop. So it's the same for exercise five. And then we feel free to explore the notebook and answer those questions by yourself. And then we will send 
uh, the answers after this workshop to you. Um, so with that being said, I think I will pass to uh, Genevieve. So unless we can answer just one question about hail or the... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And if, um, did you wanna just introduce, uh, okay, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, take a few more minutes and we can wrap up quickly. Uh, I see like to post what questions or what operations will be computational intensive when using Helm matrix table. The mo for, for notebook, for the exercise uh, six or four, the most expensive one is to recompute uh, the allele frequency, allele number and allele count. Yeah, that is the most expensive one, especially if you are using the variant QC or sample QC. But can I also talk about densify the table sometimes? Densify up. the table. So you don't have to densify the hail matrix table here. So all the hail matrix table we mentioned in the of us data set, it is already uh, densified hail matrix table. You don't have to do that. So unless you're talking about a VDS, that is uh, out of the uh, the scope of this workshop, uh, we can talk more if we have chance for the next workshop. So what's general idea? What is it? Like a populate the empty cell because it's sparse table and then Yes, it is sparse table. So if okay. yeah, that's all right. Gen okay. Yeah, general idea is sparse and intensified. Yeah. How do you know the function available? How do we know the functions available in Hale for each step? How do you know? the functions available in here for each step. So yeah, this is the base. Uh, you need to um, learn a little bit about Hale. And Hale has a very, very uh, good documentation um, to show you what functions they have for each step. And I mentioned that you can, for example, you can filter samples and variants uh, from the Hale matrix table and we introduced some functions here. And then you can also search uh, here documentation to get your answer. And then will there be a future people's workshop by chance? I think uh, if that, that is, is a popular request, uh, probably we'll have it. Feel free to send a request to the support and then we will consider it in the future. So I think I can pass to Genevieve. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the last, few minutes, we're just gonna wrap up. Um, I'll share my screen. So I just wanted to share some of the, uh, so we, I know we weren't all able to run the notebooks. I know most of us weren't able to run the notebooks today. I wasn't. So, this is something that is ready to go and available if you want to explore further. We went through the details of what these notebooks are doing. And in addition, all of the notebooks are well commented so you know what each step um, is happening. And we got through exercise four and Jennifer introduced the advanced GWAS exercise five and six. And so there's information in those notebooks with that advanced um, with the uh, extra QC and extra details there. So go ahead and if you wanna run that, feel free. And we're gonna post the questions and answers for all of these exercises in that, in our, um, in our, in the article that has all of the resources for this, this workshop. So we will post there, we'll post the recording, we will post the slides and we'll post the, um, exercise question and answers so that you're able to practice that on your own and better understand the genomic data set. And we have a survey. Um, if the TAs can post this in the chat, this is really helpful for us for developing more material so we better know what you all want to know about and what you want further insight into and how this went Today, I, I know I'm really thankful for all of your patience while we worked through all of these 
issues. And um, I hope even with all these issues, you were able to learn more about the genomics data and how you can use it for your research. So, so we still have 10 minutes. You can probably yeah. spend, take these 10 minutes to take your survey and ask mm -hmm. your questions. Yeah, so here are some additional resources. Um, we have office hours generally twice a week. There's a live event calendar linked here in the slides that you have access to. And that is where you can come live with all your questions if you don't wanna send them via email. Our support team is really wonderful. I know you've seen them in the Q&A feature and in the chat and they're, they're able to deep dive into issues during these office hours. We also have the user support like we've talked about. And then I wanted to highlight that a lot of our, our material for this, um, this workshop was developed from this featured workspace. So this is called how to work with all of us genomic data using Hale and Plink. So this also goes into Plink and it is more in depth than what we covered today. Today was mostly an intro, but I would recommend that as your next step. And then you can also start to understand more CRAM data and IGV in um, the All of Us Researcher Workbench with this, this workspace right here. Um, we talked a lot about the resources on the support hub and feel free to request um, questions that you have and we can make sure all those get answered so it's easiest for everyone. Um, I wanted to just say again to please fill out our survey. It's really helpful for us when we are trying to develop new content and new material. And um, let's see, I think that is the end. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and try to make sure that we answer everyone's burning questions to wrap up the day. Um, Paseya, I see you have a question. Yes. Um, um, I was able to run the, um, the analysis all the way. As you can see, you are seeing my screen? I can see your screen, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I was able to do all the exercises. But the question is, when do you teach us how to set up these kind of uh, statements? The things you prepare, we can run, but we have to ask our own question. So how do you show us when, where to find the functions, how to put them together? Yeah, so those are all resources um, <clears throat> with HAIL genomic analysis. So. If you want to check out the genetic methods in HALE, that, um, let me share on the chat, HALE documentation. So this is something we've developed and Jennifer has developed in order to do these analyses by learning more about HALE and by understanding HALE better. So this is just one example of what you can do and you can definitely take this example and apply it to other things other than height. We used height today, but there are other things in other phenotypic data you can use. But if you want to use other methods, go ahead and check out the HALE documentation and learn more about what's available there. Does that answer your question? Partially, yes. Okay. Okay, so please like... spend some time to take the survey. It helps us to improve our uh, next workshop. Yeah, and thank you all for being here and persisting through some of these issues. And we hope that you, um, you're understanding even further uh, about the genomic data and how to implement it. Where is the survey? I, I, I don't see the survey link. Oh yes, the chat is moving so fast. Let's get that back up there. Uh, can we'll we send, send it out. the link of the survey to the participants via email? After yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. That would be that would be easier. 
or yeah, Chris probably FYI. can send it right now via email. Yeah, I'll send it. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll just wait in case there's anything else we want to send with them with that in that email. I'm just going to keep bombarding people, but um, people have already filled it out. So thank you to those of you who have. Um, I can already see some results. So thank you. Nathan, you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if y'all had an idea on the number of participants that causes these crashing issues. Like if I was going to teach a little group at my institution how to do this, if I had said five, ten people would probably not have these issues. Yeah, I think five to ten would be doable. We talked to our engineers yesterday and looks like they were mentioning there's some limit about 50 at some point, but we're not, we're still looking into the underlying issue to make, make sure we can have big workshops because we know there's so much interest in learning about all of this. So, and we wanted to admit as many people as we could, but. Um, yeah, yeah. And we yeah. didn't know for sure if this was going to happen. <laughs> so we learned, yeah. unfortunately, on, on along the way. And we really appreciate everyone's patience throughout this process. But um, yeah, it was a little bit of a stress test on the system. No, that's good. That's good. So at Vanville is going to have uh, uh, one week uh, to hurry on all of our data. Uh, there is one session on genomic data. Is that going to cover the same content as you cover today? That's a really good question. Could you, um, could you repeat the question? Right. So, uh, no, I mean, the, has, the, uh, the answer, the answer. right? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, I, I think she, so. Izzy was saying that there's going to be like an in-person workshop for right. people who are, you know, nearby Vanderbilt mm -hmm. uh, next week, mm -hmm. I believe. And um, I don't know. That's a really good question. I can um, try to look into that. I, um, let's see. I don't I, know if I, anyone else. I yeah, can Michael. briefly speak to that. Um, it will probably not be exactly the same. It will probably have a lot of similar themes. Um, it will be the genetic part. It's, it's a multi-day. This is for only in-person um, at the Vanderbilt campus. Um, and, and it will be led by a uh, assistant professor at Vanderbilt. So he might uh, do things a little bit differently, but it'll probably have a lot of the similar uh, themes. In, in okay. okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, well, people are wrapping up. Is there anything, are there any questions that we want to go over? Anything people want to say? I also want to highlight, um, especially if they're very basic questions, if we went through this too fast, or if there's any like very basic level questions that you're curious about, please, especially those would be great to go at this time. Um, uh, this is Hui Yu. So the the disk, the persistent disk, costs a um, monthly uh, expense. What about the workspace? Is there a specific storage cost associated with a uh, bucket? Yes, there is. I'm pretty sure it's minimal, um, but there is there is um, there are some costs associated with it if you keep if you keep files in the workspace bucket. I'm pretty sure it's less than the PD. Um, it, so it might depend okay. on it depends on that but yeah. I, I i think it will depend on how much data you have in the bucket so uh, yeah. someone asked someone asked earlier about like cleanup of workspace bucket data and how to do it i think that is worth learning and maybe just spending a couple minutes showing people how to do it um maybe as a part of the workshop but it, it will be good for you to just keep an eye on keeping minimal data in the bucket if you just want to minimize cost and if you have no data in that bucket then there is no like default charge for that bucket it's only if you have data in there yeah okay. that's why that's why we also have created so many of these ready to go data sets so that you don't have to do all of the variant calling steps and all of the 
uh, subsetting of the VDS steps, a lot of that is already done so that the, the data that you're gonna store in your workspace bucket is smaller. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So Thank you. I have a question about the cost for accessing the HAO matrix table. I know if we extract genomic data, it costs like, for sample, if we only query the table, will it be a cost involved or it just like computing cost involved? If you're, um, oh, go ahead, Genevieve. You go first. I was gonna say, in terms of how you're querying that data, I, I think step one would be building the compute environment so that you can, um, so that's the place where you're executing your filtering code from. So that compute environment where you run your filtering commands, that compute environment costs money. Uh, and that's the thing that ends up being the cost rather than the, the queries themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not per sample kind of thing. If I only query one common variant, and then that's just the time I'm using on the clock. That is the time. Yes, it's how long it took. It's the time of the environment running that costs money, correct? Okay, thank you. And if, if you are running, so if you're running really high level commands that need a lot of compute power, then you need to have an environment with more compute power and then that costs more money per hour. Got it, thank you. Um, I have a question about the variant annotation table. I was wondering if that's appropriate to, to ask right now. We're gonna go over that tomorrow, but if it's something quick, um, feel free to ask it now. Um, I just had a question about the, the information available within the, tutors, or within the table. Um, and I was wondering if, um, because there's certain variant annotations that I'd like to um, analyze that aren't contained in the variant annotation table. And I was wondering if there was a way to annotate variants like such as like that annotation um, in order to get like CAD scores, polyfin scores, things like that for variants that aren't available in the variant annotation table. So if they're not already in the variant annotation table, then you would need to do that annotation um, on your own. But the variant annotation table has all all the variants that pass quality control filtering. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not it's not about the number of variants, it's about the annotations for those variants. So if there's oh, additional okay. annotations that I would like, um, I would like to to analyze. Um, I was yeah. wondering if there was a agreed upon process to annotate variants, um, more more detailed annotation that isn't currently in the variant annotation table. I don't think we have a featured workspace right now for doing that. Okay. Um, but I would also recommend sending an email to the support hub for okay. if there's any databases you want us to add, because every time we release more data, we take into consideration what users are using. And like I said, we want to reduce the amount of computation that everyone needs to do if people are using the same resources. Absolutely. Okay, well, I will send an email to the, um, to the support line, um, just because I would like to um, annotate these on my own in the workspace but I want to make sure that I'm doing it, um, you know, according to your protocols, so. Okay, yeah, thank you. sounds good. Uh, I'll put it in the chat, but for those interested about the storage, it's uh, 0.026 cents for per gigabyte for the workspace bucket storage. So as they said, it's very minimal. Okay, looks like we're wrapping up and we will answer all the remaining questions tomorrow and get everyone set to go. So thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, okay, sounds like we wrapped up a lot of the questions. Thank you all for coming with a lot of questions and um, we're happy you're here and I think we can end, end a little two minutes early. Look at us go.